share my screen. And we are going to get this thing cooking. So, uh, Marianne. <laughs> Marianne, can you see it? Yes, I can see the slides on the side to the left. And I great. Can see All right, great. So I am going to mute you and we are going to get started. Thank you for verifying that. And away we go. All right, everybody. Well, thank you for joining. I really appreciate it, taking time out of your schedule. I don't know if it's busy or not with everything going on with COVID right now. A lot of us are isolated at home. So uh, I figured seven o'clock would be a good time to do this after dinner or working from home or uh, school, uh, helping your kids with homework since everybody's being homeschooled right now. And I know some kids are on spring break, some schools aren't. So I just want to thank you for joining me tonight to go through this uh, Get Real Deal and Heal Man uh, webinar, and uh, we are going to get started. So I always like to start off with something a little funny, right? So, uh, you know, I thought this was funny. I saw this online, and it's uh, man can, shut up and drink, right? And uh, I thought it was a funny thing to start off with because, you know, wouldn't it be great, right, if we could all get our masculinity in a can, if we could learn all the things that we were supposed to learn when we were uh, younger, right, growing up uh, about how to be vulnerable, how to express our feelings, how to... Uh, you know, be our true authentic selves. And it was, and it incorporated the whole playbook, right? Uh, of how to be a man in this, in this world, uh, which has changed a lot with all the things that uh, we see with toxic masculinity. So I just thought this was a funny thing to start off with. And I hope uh, you get a chuckle, chuckle out of that. So how are you feeling, right? That's the big question you know, that a lot of people ask. And I know for myself, if I was doing this presentation uh, uh, live, I would say, how many people raise your hand if you could identify with any of these, right? I know I can, I could raise my hand and say that I identify with practically all these uh, at some point in my life, dissatisfied with my career, depleted, anxious, resentful, sad, angry, or unfulfilled. Uh, you know, need drugs or alcohol to wind down, have to have that glass of wine so I could take the edge off. Worried about your partner, mentioning divorce, been there, done that. Letting yourself go physically, well, that kind of ties into a lot of different things with uh, eating and a bunch of other stuff besides drinking and doing drugs when you're not feeling your best. Struggling to communicate your wants and needs, uh, struggled that for a long time. Frustrated about coming home to family because there's not enough time for you, right? Feeling appreciated. Uh, I'm scared to go home because then I have to put on my daddy and husband hat on and oh my God, I'm going to go out of my mind. I just need an hour for myself, with, which kind of ties into struggling to communicate your wants and needs, right? We're scared to do that because we're afraid that we're not going to get what we want or get what we need, which kind of ties into self-centered fear. Either you're afraid you're not going to get what you want or need, or you're afraid you're going to lose what you have instead of staying in the present moment. So I know that I could identify with, that, with these, and I'm sure you can too. So what screws us up most in life is the picture in our heads of how it's supposed to be, right? How many of us probably had these unrealistic expectations about you know, what life was supposed to be or how it's supposed to be, that maybe life should be fair. How many of us, uh, you know, think of that sometimes, that life should be fair, everything should work out, and we should never have any problems. Or opportunities will just fall in our lap. Right. I've been there, done that, but reality is you have to do the footwork, and maybe they'll fall into your lap, Right. People should know what I want, agree with me, or know what I'm going to say. 
these are all like unrealistic expectations that we kind of have uh, with life. I'm going to fail, right? That's something that we have a fear of or another thing would be a belief like these things, the beliefs, uh, I'm not good enough, right? Or things will make me happy, you know, not just what's going on internally inside of us to make us happy, which is kind of being self-reflective, introspective, and uh, working on some things in order to appreciate some of the things that are not materialistics, you know, uh, being grateful for, our, for the family that we have, the fact that we have roofs over our head, you know, we have this, this, what screws us up most in life is the picture in our heads of how it's supposed to be, of having all these materialistic things, more and more and more and more and more. And last but not least, I could change anybody. Uh, that's unrealistic, right? So we, we come into this world thinking that, you know, uh, or this vision that we have that things should be different. So a little bit about me and why I created Yo Manga. So I was born February 17th, 1970. I know, Bruce, you're on the uh, call here. If you're still on the call, <laughs> you can remember that picture probably. Uh, I think that's a picture you actually posted on Facebook one time. Yeah, I remember. <laughs> so, you know, this is uh, me way back when. Uh, I was always into sports. Uh, and, you know, I had uh, some... Uh, I grew up in a very unique uh, kind of uh, upbringing where uh, it was, I was raised in a lesbian environment. Uh, my parents got divorced because my mother couldn't really live the lie anymore that, uh, you know, being born in 1945 and having those feelings all our life, uh, you know, during the 1970s when, you know, the, uh, when, when Harvey Milk came out and, was trying to uh, raise awareness and understanding of people who are gay. Also, when the uh, Psychological Institute decided to take out of the DSM book, which is something that um, it, the psychologists and psychiatrists and therapists use for mental illness, they finally took out that people who were gay had mental illnesses. So, you know, my mother decided that she couldn't live this lie anymore. And, you know, as a result of that, there were some things that happened. I had some abandonment issues because my mom came out. My aunt and uncle decided that they didn't want to have anything to do with us. So, you know, during the course of my life, I went to therapy. My dad actually kind of uh, got remarried and moved to Florida. So that was an abandonment issue I had to deal with. And, you know, growing up, you know, the, the slide that I showed you about using drugs and alcohol to, to, to feel my, to, you know, to kind of cover up the feelings that I was feeling of the insecurity and the loneliness and the lack of love, um, you know, led me to uh, drinking too much. And I had to go to AA and kind of for four years, I went to AA to uh, work the program. And at the same time, I was going to therapy and realized that I wasn't an alcoholic, but there was a lot of things that I needed that I was, you know, that I, that I kind of had to work on. And it was about self-compassion and self-love. And then, you know, relationships kind of changed my view of how things are. You know, I was involved, I was married, and unfortunately that didn't work out. And I've always been kind of self-reflective about certain things. Uh, when life was always hard for me, uh, I could always remember looking in the mirror. And, and you know, when I usually, it, it was most of the time when I felt like I was uh, down in the dumps and life wasn't working for me, right? Uh, I would always look in the mirror and say, Dan, you're capable of so much more. You're capable of so much more. And I think that, that what, that's what really kept me on the straight and narrow of not really going down uh, a really bad path. Um, and then basically through the relationships, I, I met somebody who really opened my eyes to a lot of different things about uh, how I wasn't communicating properly. Uh, I read a lot of books, followed a lot of authors such as Deepak Chopra, Wayne Dyer, Eckhart Tolle, Tony Robbins. I can remember when I was in my early 20s, I bought his first cassette uh, thing that he had put out. So I was always kind of interested in in um, becoming better and, and trying to find really what I was supposed to do in this world. Uh, yoga and meditation came into my life about eight years ago, and that was really the catalyst that 
opened my eyes to a lot of different things on how to breathe, uh, how to keep my medi how to keep my anxiety under control, how to slow down the turbulent thoughts in my mind. And then I uh, was introduced to positive psychology and I had this aha moment uh, when I was laid off from my job after 11 years uh, working in IT that I needed to do something with my life. And it wasn't IT that there's a purpose for me in this world. And it's really to try and help people. Like I've always been a person who wanted to uh, help people who are less fortunate than myself. Um, so I was thinking to myself, since I really love yoga and, uh, and I like meditation, what can I create and bring to the world that would uh, contribute and become a change agent, right? So I decided to get certified in positive psychology. I'm a coach in that. I'm also a coach in uh, mindset, transformational mindset work as well. So I'm dual certified. And I said, you know what? In May of 2018, I said, I'm going to create this thing called Yomenga. Don't know how it came to me. I was sitting on my couch one day. I said, what, what would be a cool name to open up a yoga studio uh, for men? And the reason why I wanted to do it for men was because I felt that all there was things that I do to my upbringing that I should have learned um, and that I didn't learn and not, not necessarily learn, but more so I still got bit by the bug of masculine, like the, the bug of mass toxic masculinity, so to speak, or just not learning the things that I needed to learn, you know? Um, so I, I thought that was kind of, kind of odd and I and I look at my life and be like wow maybe that happened for a reason and then all these things happen with like Matt Lauer and all these high profile stars and you know the women's movement was coming on and uh, the Me Too movement and I said you know what this is what I was meant to do to bring something to the world to help men and try to teach them about masculinity so that's a little bit about me and why I created Yo Manga so this is my vision of modern masculinity, right? Uh, you could probably identify with this. I think they're funny. I don't always cry, but when I do, it's the Whitney Houston, I will always love you. Uh, cried for the first time in 20 years today. Feel like I found myself again. So, you know, I just think that that's kind of funny. Um, so where does this masculinity ideology originate from? Does anyone really know? Well, you know, I've listed three things here, uh, and I think you could kind of identify that they do contribute to this uh, version of masculinity. Um, TV and advertising is a big thing, and it's not just, you know, men, but also women, TV and advertising of, um, you know, for, for this particular instance, for men, it's, you know, you see these guys who are strong, the Marlboro man, I'm, I remember the Marlboro man way back when driving the horse and he had a cigarette and it was like, he's the macho guy, right? So it started even when I was young, I can't remember how, how old I was when that came out, but I could remember like, wow, the Marlboro man's really cool. And that's how it got me to to try smoking cigarettes and like smoking cigarettes is a cool thing to do and you have to be tough and bravado uh biologically right we could look at biologically you know we are wired um for negative bias uh that's just the way we are but due to due to our um biology of when we were cavemen uh we have this fight flight and freeze mechanism built into us uh, so that kind of, you know, contributes to some of the negativity bias that we, we actually have. And it's not a bad thing. You know, we have this limbic system and we'll go into that, that protects us, but we also have evolved and have this prefrontal cortex, which helps us think logically. So biologically, we are wired for that, not a bad thing, but when the fear and, and those things kind of overtake who we really are and we get stuck in those those uh those emotions that we have then that becomes a problem society society as a whole i think i mentioned it already about the influences i know growing up my dad or some of my friends would say to me ah don't be a wussy you know man up you know don't uh you know you have to you have to be strong or let's go to the bar and have a drink you have a drink you'll be fine 
So, you know, these things I think are all uh, the, the TV and advertising and society are kind of all man-made things, which are truly myths, uh, biological. Yes, that's something that we have to just adhere to. But once we understand how we're wired biologically and how our brains work, I think it makes it easier to, to uh, understand why we do the things that we do or say some of the things that we say. So what are the myths about masculinity? So men are taught they are breadwinners, their wives should stay home and raise the kids. Uh, we're taught to minimize and trivialize people's feelings. Uh, things aren't that big of a deal, right? Even now with this whole coronavirus thing, we have some people that are saying, oh, it's not that big of a deal. Let's uh, get the economy going again. Well, things are a big deal. So, uh, you know, the, that's what we're taught. Uh, we're taught to exaggerate and boast about, you know, our talents and gifts. Men like to do that because I know for myself, from my own experience, when I was dating, I would kind of make myself a little uh, more educated or try to impress a lady with saying things that kind of really didn't pertain to me because I was worried about what she thought of me. And I think a lot of men have a problem with worrying about what other people think of them, not just men, but for, I think a lot of people do. It's just uh, something in general, but uh, I men, uh, I know that I could identify with that. We're taught to express disdain for those who seem inferior. Uh, expressing your feelings makes them a sissy. So if you, you know, like uh, I used an example before, if don't be a sissy, man up. Uh, and they're also taught to believe they're better than others. And that's not really uh, the right way of, uh, of what, of how we should be teaching our sons as they're growing up, that they're better than others, we should be teaching them to be helpful and to be happy for others when they actually do something great. And maybe we could learn something from that. So what are the masculine types, right? So we have the shy guy, he's quiet and untalkative. We have the tough guy, he's aggressive, fearless, and invulnerable. We have the homophobic guy, avoid any features of femininity whatsoever. We have the strong and silent guy, stoic and in control. We have the playboy player guy who, you know, emotional support via lustful means. You know, uh, we see a lot of that with uh, uh, people going to jail right now as a result of that. Bill Cosby and uh, I forgot the other gentleman's name who's uh, Harvey Weinstein right now who's in jail. And, you know, we create, so I just like to touch on this one a little bit because, you know, one of the things that, um, society, when we had that one slide, how society kind of causes this problem is, look, we have pornography and we have uh, 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 strip clubs, right? And what happens is men aren't taught how to keep the fantasy in the club or in their home. And that becomes a problem, obviously. And then we have the winner, success by any means necessary, right? Uh, and that could mean just kind of having someone uh, doing mean things to someone just to get ahead of them, being sneaky, being guileless. And that's not the right way to be. So what do we want to strive? What do we want to teach our children, our, our you know, sons growing up? We want to teach them to be a humble warrior. We want them to be empathetic, have high emotional intelligence, be communicative and confident. Very important. I like this. This is so funny. I like to put these little slides in just as a little icebreaker here. And what are the truth about feelings, right? So this is funny. I'm hungry. I'm horny. My butt itches. I just let one, <laughs> right? So Liz regrets asking her husband to share his feelings more. How many of us could identify with that? I know I, I probably said that quite a few times. So why don't men discuss their feelings or emotions? could be fear of embarrassment, being judged, can't be your true authentic self, you're afraid that you're going to, you know, be judged by your peers at work or your friends um and you know that's that tends to be a problem uh because that that kind of affects your self-esteem, 
um, you know, also your self-compassion for yourself. You don't have the self-compassion. Uh, mental health difficulties could cause it as well. Um, you know, that could be because you're drinking alcohol, um, which is called or doing drugs or finding something that would uh, help uh, you deal with the turbulence that is going on in your mind. Um, and that could be very detrimental to emotionally, physically, spiritually, intellectually to your health. You have a fixed mindset. You just say that this is the way that I am. This is the way society is. And there is no way that I'm going to change. Nothing's going to change instead of developing a growth mindset. Uh, and lastly, which I think is really the, the core issue of this whole thing is you were never taught. Uh, there was never a playbook that was given to any of us that said, this is how you are supposed to be. This is the playbook on how to be a man. And it's very difficult. So that's one of the reasons why I'm here trying to, you know, change that. So men and women, uh, they view emotional support very differently, right? Men are less likely to talk about problems. We're just not as communicative. Uh, we're less tuned into others' distress. We're more into ourselves. And we provide instrumental support. You know, we want to give the advice instead of learning to learn to listen, listen to learn, you know, we want to be able to provide that support uh, because we're on to one thing to the next, to the next, to the next. The way that our brains work, we're kind of like, give me the details, I'll do it, and then I'm done. Women, on the other hand, are better at reading partners. They value support more and they provide more emotional support. So, you know, it's kind of like uh, learning each other's different language, right? Men are from Mars, women are from Venus. I can remember that book. And I, I truly believe that that book had, had, had some really good scientific uh, things in there that proved a lot of things on uh, how men and women are different. And, you know, it's, for me, um, personally, I think I'd like to take it a step further is that vulnerability, I don't believe has a masculine or feminine trait to it. I think both people should be able to understand uh, that being vulnerable, when you're vulnerable, you're able to communicate your feelings, your wants and needs, you're not scared about what other people think or think about you. And really, it's just it transcends that. So, you know, what we're trying to teach men is how to become vulnerable, how to learn to love yourself, how to not have unrealistic expectations, how not to be a perfectionism, how not to let self-centered fear get in the way of things, how to, uh, you know, have gratitude for your life. And more, most importantly, how to live in the moment are keys to being able to have great relationships uh, regardless if it, uh, who you're with, with your children, with your business partners, with your wife, um, whomever, whomever, that's what we're trying to, that's who we're trying to, that's what men, that's what I want to teach the men. And that's what I want to want to teach to my sons who are 16 and 13. So they could, you know, contribute to society in a healthy way. So what's going to happen? What's going to happen? Men are going to be left behind. And I know, you know, this is kind of a, uh, could be a, uh, a saying or, or could hit you a man with, with like, how am I going to be left behind? They could have a lot of, uh, uh, made me come angry over this. But with what's going on today in today's society with the Me Too movement and how women are, become getting more involved in politics and businesses and other things, which is great. I can't wait. I'm so glad to hear that Biden is going to pick a woman to be vice president. I think that's awesome. And I hope one day that that person, hopefully Biden will get elected. Just my own opinion. I try to keep politics out of this. Uh, we'll have a woman president one day. But, you know, the reason why I bring up this slide is because it's the way that men communicate. And if we don't become our true authentic selves and become vulnerable, we're going to run into issues. And the next couple of slides, I'll, I'll show you why. So the shift is happening. 
So women are thriving in an advanced economy, making provider husbands and husbands optional. Women own firms, 51% or more, account for 39% of all privately held firms and contribute 8% of employment and 4.2% 4 .2 of revenues. More than 11.6 million firms are owned by women employing nearly 9 million people and generating $1.7 trillion in sales as of 2017. So just imagine it's 2020 now, and I have to find the statistics for this. This is from the 2017 National Association of Women Business Owners. One in five firms with revenues of 1 million or more is owned by women. 4.2% uh, of all women for all woman firms uh, have revenues of 1 million or more. Now that's awesome. It's great. It's great that that's happening. And listen, men, you're not as smart as you think you are. And why is that? Because I have the statistics, right, for education. And this is from 2017. And I have to go back and look at 2018 and 2019, but the trends are going up. We just see what's going on and I wouldn't think, and the numbers might even be higher right now. But in performance, girls outperform boys from elementary school through graduate school. That's happening now. The SATs, young men's SAT scores in 2011 were the lowest in 40 years. Dropouts, according to the NCES, boys are 30% more likely to drop out of high school and college. Reading and writing, by eighth grade, 20% of boys are adept at writing and 24 are adept at reading. Special ed, boys make up two thirds of students in special ed remedial programs. And in education, in 2017, women will earn more than 60% of bachelor's degrees and more than 63% of master's degrees. And like I said, I'm sure those numbers probably have increased. I'd have to look those up, but these are the numbers that I had found uh, recently. So let's talk about the divorce rates, right? So I found this interesting is that uh, these are the divorce rates for adults ages 50 and older has roughly doubled in the past 25 years. So you could see from ages 25 to 39, there really isn't an actual negative number um, because probably because maybe you just got married, right? Between those ages, uh, you're probably, and then if you look at 40 to 49, between 30 and 40, you're probably having your kids, right? But between 40 and 49, it's gone up 14%, plus four, excuse me, plus 14%. And then when people turn 50, the divorce rate goes up to 109%. Now, why is that? Probably because I would think that the, you know, now the kids are out of the house, it's empty nest, you work so hard, you know, the, the husband worked hard, he, maybe if he was the breadwinner, um, and you know, now the two have to be, and they really didn't communicate a lot because they were busy you know, uh, taking care of the kids, that may, that may contribute to it. But let's take a look at why. So I put this, these are the third, at first I only had women, the women's, women's reasons, but I said, you know what, let's put the men's reasons in here as well. So these are the 13 reasons people leave their marriages or relationships. So for women, there's six reasons. They feel underappreciated and over responsible for the relationship. There's repetitive arguments. They're dissatisfied with their sex life. There's insufficient talking and emotional connection, which kind of ties into number three. If you have that, then it's kind of dissatisfied with the sex life because women are more emotionally, uh, instinctually, they're nurturers, right? Women are nurturers. Uh, they've outgrown their husbands and divorce is the only option to put themselves first again. Now, what are the seven reasons why men get a divorce? They don't feel appreciated. They're at odds with their spouse about spending. Someone cheated. They don't have anything in common with their partner anymore. They feel inadequate. Sex is lackluster or totally non-existent. And seven, they don't feel their needs are being recognized or validated. So, you know, I, I, it's so funny because when you kind of compare the two, you could see, uh, you know, the paradox of how they kind of line up with each other here. Uh, some do, some don't. But 
you know, I always share the story of, um, you know, something that happened with me. And I just never realized it. When I mentioned the word that women are nurturers, I didn't really understand that women. I understood that women were nurturers if they were going to stay home and take care of the kids, right? Because that's the arrangement that men make with their wives. But for some reason, that stopped there. Like, I didn't realize that, you know, my wife wanted to take care of me as well. So I use this as an example of kind of how uh, this falls into maybe number seven for a man. And uh, let's see, uh, might be number four, maybe for a woman. So, you know, a woman will come home, a guy will come home and it's the weekend on a Friday and a a woman will say, a wife will say to her husband, she's had the kids, hey, what would you like to do this weekend? And the husband will automatically say, and I know I've done it, whatever you want, honey. Because in our minds, we're thinking, oh, they took care of the kids, let them do what they want. It's, you know, we're doing, we're trying to do the right thing by saying that, but we weren't taught that the woman is trying to show her appreciation, basically that you're going out and being the breadwinner for the family. And you just didn't answer the question right. (laughs) Right? You, she's basically trying to show you the, pre, the appreciation and instead you just totally missed it. Why? Because men don't learn this. We become people pleasers, right? We learn how to open up the doors for women. We learn how to do certain things. But when it comes to, you know, expressing our wants and needs and understanding that our wives are nurturers and they want to show us appreciation, we miss the boat. And then what happens? Resentment starts to build. And then over time, we kind of, guys start to realize they don't feel their needs are being recognized or validated. And then a woman will feel there's insufficient talking and emotional connection. And that's how it goes downhill. So, you know, these are the things that, you know, men need to learn, right, in order to salvage their relationships, not just in, with, their, with their significant others, but this, this goes into business as well learning there's a bunch of different things that people men in particular who i want to work on need to learn so what do men need to learn to become their authentic selves well i'm going to go over three different things and the fourth thing well we could talk about that if you want to come work with me that would be great so let's talk about brain physiology and function let's talk about what the difference is between a fixed judger versus growth learner mindset What's the importance of self-regulation and the risks of lacking? So brain physiology. So for me, this was a huge thing for me to learn, right? Because it was just something that I never had any concept of. And once I understood the physiology of the brain and how my mind worked, helped me understand that I could be the observer and conductor of my mindset in real time, which is really called real-time resilience. Uh, so this is the three part brain I've touched on a little bit earlier. So, you know, back in the caveman days, we had the lizard brain. It was fight, flight, or freeze, right? We had these dinosaurs that were chasing us around and we had to survive. And we had this lizard brain and this is what animals, this is what actual lizards have, right? And then what's happened, our brains developed into the mammal brain. So which combined the mammal brain and the lizard brain. So this is something like a dog, right? A dog would would be considered something that has a mammal brain because they have feelings. You know, you could see a dog has feelings and they also have the fight, flight, and freeze. And then we've developed us as humans. We have the human brain, which is the neocortex, which is the language, abstract thought, imagination, consciousness, reasoning, the rationalizing. Right. So when we talked, when I learned about this, the difference between what our sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system is, right, which is part of our autonomic nervous system, that our sympathetic nervous system is our fight, flight, and freeze, where we become anxious and, you know, uh, we it it motivates us to do something if we're where something is happening that uh, is causing this these these these. Um, which I say uh, chemicals that run through our body, that is the auto flight, autopilot, the fight, flight and freeze. And, and, you know, and our emotions start to 
uh, get charged up. Our limbic system is charged. So when we get into like an argument with our significant other, that's when our limbic system is activated, right? Both the limbic and, and also the lizard brain, because sometimes we get to a point in an argument instead of working, uh, uh, thinking with our human brain, which is our prefrontal cortex, which is this part, our reasoning brain, instead of being able to say, I feel my body starting to get anxious. I feel my back starting to tighten up. I feel myself starting to like, get really angry because we're not understanding each other. We need to take a time out, right? Uh, we instead, we go full tilt and we do something stupid, maybe uh, punch a hole through a door or something, right? That's, that's kind of, I, I can admit that because there was times where I got so pissed off that I punched a hole in the wall or, or in the, or in the door. And then that's not the right way of behaving. So once I was able to understand how I have the control over that, that there are tools that I could use such as nonviolent communication, uh, being able to breathe, being able to communicate a want and need, being able to validate, understanding that, you know, once the feeling, once I have that feeling of anger, that the rush of chemicals that goes through my body really only takes 90 seconds before it fully is going through my, my body, that after the 90 seconds, it's my brain, it's my thoughts that are just, could keep, could go into that catastrophizing thinking and obsessive thinking and causing myself my own, being my own worst enemy. So, what is the mindset formula kind of lead into that a little bit, you know? So what is it? So we have our mindset, we have our beliefs, the things that we've created right in our lives. And once I was able to understand that we have that beliefs are decisions, right? Uh, one of the beliefs I'd mentioned earlier in this, uh, in this presentation was not good enough. Right. And I'll use it. I'll, I, you know, that's a belief that we have. Right, but I'll use a different example um, to try to explain what I'm articulating here. So, our beliefs have a direct correlation with our thoughts, right? So, when we have a thought, for instance, let's use dogs, fear of dogs. So, what happened when we were little? I know for myself, I got bit by a dog. Every time I'd ride past this person's house, this Raymond Torres guy, Bruce, you probably know, you remember that guy, he had this dog that would always chase you. And one day he bit me right in my chest. And I, therefore, I developed this belief that all dogs are bad, right? So whenever, since beliefs are, are totally in, uh, correlated with our thoughts, when I saw a dog, automatically my thought was that all dogs are bad. And what did that, ha what does my thought have a direct correlation with? Your thoughts have a direct correlation with a feeling. Right. So when I, when I saw a dog, I say all dogs are bad. Basically I get a feeling of fear. Right. And that, that feeling is in a direct correlation with an action. And that action would be, I'm not going near that dog. Right. And the result would be that I can't go over that person's house ever again because I have that dog. I just can't go in because I have this fear of dog. And then that psycho cybernetic loop just keeps happening and happening and happening and happening. And once I understood really that, you know, the brain creates these neuro pathways, right? Because the brain, you know, was really kind of just a collection device. There was a Harvard study that, um, that showed that, uh, they brought in people who played the piano, a certain piece, and they did fMRI, fMRI scans on their brains, and uh, you know certain parts of their brain lit up. Then they took another group of people who knew how to play the piano and basically told them, "We want you to just imagine you playing the same pieces that the actual piano players who actually played the piano just imagine you playing that." And when they did the fMRI scans on their brain, when they compared the two, the same parts of the brain lit up. So your brain really can't differentiate between what's reality and what's imagination. Therefore, when you basically develop these beliefs that, you know, the dogs are, the dog is bad, you have the option really of making a decision. And the decision is to basically say that, all dogs are good, 
right? And then there's things that you actually have to do to kind of change that belief, which is deliberate practice, pet some dogs, maybe go to a shelter, maybe even get a dog yourself, right? It's kind of the same way that, and you create this new neural pathway, right? That, and as you do that, the old one, the old belief, which may be there for the rest of your life because it, it will always be there. But once you've changed that belief that all dogs are good, it's very hard to go back that all dogs are bad. It's kind of almost like when you change your password on your computer every 90 days, you basically type in the same password for 90 days. Then the administrator says, time to change your password. You get up, you go get a cup of coffee, you come back, you start to uh, type in the old password and basically you're like, oh, I changed my password. But with deliberate practice, right, typing in the new one over and over again, slowly you shed that old neural pathway and create the new one. And that's how you change your, your beliefs, right, and your thoughts. And that was very enlightening for me. So this the reason why I'm bringing this up, because when it comes to changing your beliefs that you know, the myths about masculinity or about vulnerability or about uh, that you need to be better than someone else, right? That could change. You know, you could develop this. You don't have to have a fixed mindset for that, right? You could have a growth mindset. And mindset is a belief or way of thinking that determines behaviors, outlook, or attitudes. So if you want to visualize a rock, you know, a rock is just a rock. That's basically a fixed mindset. You're judging others or yourself. You're scared to try new things for fear of failure since you believe you are what you are, right? On the opposite end of the spectrum is a growth mindset. So you visualize clay. What do, what do these uh, beautiful artists do when they take a piece of clay? They make a beautiful masterpiece, right? You're, you're on the learner path. You're, you're open to learning things, to grow, to become introspective. Uh, you, a person who has a growth mindset will always try new things, even if they fail, because they label the task as failed and not label themselves as a failure. And that goes, that, you know, is a, that's a really powerful statement there. They label the task as failed, but not label themselves as a failure, right? And you can see here, it might be a little hard to read those things, but, uh, you know, it's about choice. It's about the, the meaning you give the experience. And you always have the choice of going the learner path if you want to grow and learn. And then so it's okay that you're going to be scared sometimes to, you know, try something new or, you know, uh, and that's okay. And you may wind up going down the judger path, but while you're going down the judger path, you could change your mind. You know, you could practice real-time resilience and, you know, that's something that, that I teach that could shift your mindset to basically switch lanes and go the learner path, right? And if you don't, you're going to wind up going down the path of the judger path. So what is self-regulation, right? Self-regulation separates us from the animals. Self-regulation, control over our emotions, desires to obtain some reward or avoid punishment. We have the capacity to restrain our impulses, resist temptation, do what's right and good for us in the long run, not what we want to do right now. So it's important to understand, you know, that the choices are really up to us. And we could build the self-regulation muscle, right? That's something that could be uh, built up over time. And what are the advantages of, and disadvantages of not having high uh, self-regulation? So, when you have high emotional, when you really have high self-regulation, you fall under the high emotional intelligence. You promote optimistic points of view. Uh, this would be considered kind of a, a growth mindset. Promotes optimistic points of view. Reacts to hurts by processing feelings. Is emotionally resilient. Someone who has low emotional intelligence with self-regulations, lets negative feelings dominate, reacts to hurt with physical violence, and carries grudges and is unforgiving. So what is the difference between positive psychology that I have been schooled in and traditional psychology? Well, positive psychology 
as cognitive behavioral and humanistic therapies all really in one to help you stay north of neutral. And when I say north of neutral, north of neutral means maybe if you looked at a scale from zero to 10, north of neutral would be a seven. Wouldn't it be great in all areas of our lives that we could be a 10? But sometimes that's not realistic. It would be great if everything in your life was great all the time. But that doesn't happen. We all have these adversities that happen, just like what we're doing right now, what's happening right now with the coronavirus. Some people are knocked down from that. They could be at a seven, which is what I aim to be, down to a four, right? And what happens when you're at a four? Well, positive psychology gives you the tools to focus on what's right and aims to create more well-being, happiness, life satisfaction. It's the science of human flourishing. So we're looking at different things, you know, different areas within positive psychology, such as positivity, engagement, relationships, meaning, achievement, and vitality, where traditional psychology focuses on treating mental illness. Vitally important, but does not serve the 85% of the population without a diagnosed disorder right? If you don't have uh, depression or anxiety or something that you need, but basically you just need to learn some things such as the things we've been going over to try to help, you know, um, make your relationships better, find meaning and purpose, achievement, what do you want to achieve in life, vitality, which is your physical health, and, and positivity, overall staying at a seven, how could I stay at a seven or a 10? And if I do get knocked down to a four, what are the tools that I could use such as real-time resilience that'll get me back to a seven? So I'm not fearing like having that false evidence appearing real where I'm afraid I'm not going to lose what I have or I'm not going to get what I want or need. So why aren't you taking action, right? If you could, I resonate with this right now with everything that I've said, why wouldn't you take action? If you're feeling depleted, anxious, resentful, sad, angry, or unfulfilled, if you're having communication issues that make you feel backed into a corner, you're not pursuing the dream job, you're feeling stuck, feeling too insecure about how you look physically, fear about divorce, binge drinking or drugs to avoid the truth of how you're truly feeling, or scared to go home, right, because of anxiety and the weight of dad and husband responsibilities. I mean, how many people could really identify with that? I can. You know, I'd love to see if I was, like I said, this would be one of those moments where I'd say, how many people could identify with this? Raise your hands. And I'd be like, yes, I do. I do. So what do you do? You have two options. You could go down the downward spiral, right, which is not north of neutral. And you could stay in those situations that we just talked about, which are, you know, could fall into these different uh, characteristics, these negative characteristics that you are, uh, you know, feeling where, you know, I know I have at some point in my life earlier on how I felt where I had revenge, I had jealousy, I had you know, fear, grief, I was insecure, disappointment, I was bored, I was pessimistic, uh, or you have the option of changing things, right? Downward spiral is fixed mindset. Upward spiral, growth mindset. So what, would you, what do you want in your life? I prefer to have the upward spiral. I like to be number one. I love to have joy, knowledge, empowerment, freedom, love and appreciation, gratitude, have passion, enthusiasm, uh, positive expectation, belief, optimism, hopelessness, uh, hopefulness, sorry, that's on the other side, and contentment. So what is at risk if you don't? What is at risk if you don't take care of those issues? Uh, and what can we do to help you? Like you need help right now. What is it really costing you if you don't address these issues now? You know, some of the things that you identified with that you raised your hand to, right? If you, if we were uh, there in a room together, um, it could totally corrupt your marriage. Your marriage could be gone. And if your marriage is gone, that will lead to divorce. And then you could see right next to it, your money is going to be gone right? You could have money problems. Your health, physically, emotionally, intellectually, spiritually could be affected. Your career, you could be bouncing from job to job, right? 
how come people don't like me or appreciate me? I bust my ass and blah, 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 right? That falls into your self-worth. You fall into a victim pity pot, a uh, pity party for yourself. Your relationships are affected. Your peace of mind, your life. So what can you do? Change takes focused effort, feedback, and guidance from an experienced positivity psychology and wellness coach, right? Which is me. So what can we teach you here? We can learn how to boost your mood and build lasting happiness. Understand brain science, right? That's something that we went over. Uh, shift out of pessimism and into resilient thinking and action. That's real-time resilience. Like what can you do in real time to shift out of that pes pessimism? Communicate effectively, develop self-compassion, self-care, and empathy. Be yourself and present yourself through self-regulation, mindfulness, and meditation. Set goals and create healthy habits to achieve your dreams. What is it that you believe? Like I shared my story with you. I believe that this is the true reason why I'm on this planet. This is my purpose. This is my meaning. I've been very successful in IT and I continue to do IT, but my, my goal is to transition from IT into this, open up a Yomenga Health and Wellness Center eventually, and but also in the meantime, coach people and help people. I want to share what I've learned. I want to make the world a better place. I want to become a change agent. Utilize visualization, questions, and primers for success. Understand the science of flow and peak performance, right? You've heard the term get into the flow where, uh, you know, we use Michael Jordan when he scores like 60 points, he gets into this flow where he, he's unstoppable. Well, what can we do to get into where we could learn how to get into the flow and have peak performance in everything that we do? Unpack emotions such as awe and transcendence, which is living in the moment, appreciating the beauty around you. How many, you know, if I was to ask, if I was in front of everybody, I'd say, how many of you take the time to actually look up at the sky at a beautiful sunset or go to in New Jersey, there's a place called Washington Rock where you could go and look at it at, uh, you know, you could see New York City and just see the beautiful sunset or whatever. Unpack those emotions as such as awe and transcendent. Understand the science of optimal physical function, sleep, posture, your fascia, which a lot of people don't even know what fascia is, nutrition, nature, and movement on well-being. That's the vitality piece of all this. So what I've done is I've created this course called Get Real, Deal, and Heal. And it's a course that I created just for you. I created it for me, right? Uh, and I want to share it with you. It's modeled after my own experiences to help you understand your emotional triggers, explore the truth about masculinity, and empower you to unlock your true authentic self. And this isn't, you know, this would be a great course, not just for men, but if women are interested in this as well, it's definitely something that uh, I would teach anyone because I just want to make the world a better place, right? I want to help you stay north of neutral. Real talk, training and tools, learn how to stay north of neutral, feel safe to be open, and most importantly, right, vulnerability, you know, transcends both masculine and feminine energies. I believe vulnerability is your soul. You know, I'm a spiritual person. I believe I'm a spiritual person having human experience. It's okay if you don't believe in that, but you believe in humanistic, like, you know, humanistic principles that we should be good and nice to each other. Well, part of that is being vulnerable where you're able to communicate your feelings, your wants and needs. So what I've done, I've created this eight week coaching program. It's a one-on-one -on -one hour long Zoom meetings. It's intentional, it's transformative, and it's, the intention is to help you feel lighter and happier in your relationships. So this is the course. So it has six modules. Weeks one through six uh, is uh, what we would go over these modules, which I would mentioned earlier. Number one, module one is self-centered fear. Understand that fear is about control. Module two is unrealistic expectations, recognizing moving to healthy expectations. Module three is perfectionism, dealing head on with negative self-talk. Right? A lot of people understand these concepts. Not too many people know about self-centered fear as much, but they've heard of fear. But unrealistic expectations and perfectionism, yes, they're in the dictionary, but how many people actually pay attention to when they're doing this, right? Number four, we have to learn to love yourself. Resting comfortably within the depths of your being, 
Module five, gratitude, motivation to give thanks year round. And six, living in the moment. How do we practice mindfulness? How do we not get caught up and have our minds so turbulent that we're worried about what we don't have and worried that we're going to lose what we have? And, you know, our mind becomes very turbulent. How do we shut that off? How do we just come back to the present moment and breathe and do the things that we need to do in order to get ourselves grounded? In week seven, we go over the transformational toolkit. So it's a toolkit that I created. And we talked about deliberate practice, right? And primers and cues and how I gave you that example about the uh, changing your password and about changing your beliefs about dogs. Well, it takes deliberate practice. So I've created this transformational toolkit of things that you could print out and do in order to help you rep do repetition in order to slowly change your mindset, right? It's all about the mindset change those neural pathways from the negative beliefs into positive beliefs. And it's about personal development. And then in week eight is the long game coaching. Discuss your question, review your progress or struggles, reinforce deliberate practice, right? It's always about deliberate practice. They say it takes 21 days to change, you know, uh, change who you are and develop better habits, right? I'm taking it a bit further. I think it's closer to 60 days and maybe even more, but you have to put in the work in order to change your life. So are you ready? This is it. This is how much the course costs, right? It's an eight week program. Get real deal and heal. It's valued at a thousand. Uh, early registration enroll today, save 500. It's only 500 bucks. Payment options, two payments, 250 now, 250, 30 days later. You know, you could pay it all at once. And what it includes, all courses include the Emotional Bubble Chart Theory free download, which you go to my website, download that free, uh, free bubble chart, which helps you deal with eight emotions that we experience uh, every day, really. And it's probably good to download it now, especially what's, what's going on. If you're going stir crazy, if uh, your relationship is a little... Uh, not so good right now and you have all these emotions and we're ice we feel isolated and our kids are driving us crazy maybe it'll, it'll help you out it'll give you some really quick things on how to deal with anger sadness you know these are things that you could do and right now with that I'm actually offering a 30-day free um, I shouldn't say 30 day, 30 minute free consultation. I'm not going to charge you for it to go over the emotional bubble chart with you. I don't know if you received the email on that. I sent it out recently, but if you go onto the website and the pop-up pops up, you'll see that um, you could go uh, book a free session and we'll actually go over the emotional bubble chart. You could also, uh, if you have Alexa, you could sign up for flash briefings. So for 30 days, I put in a separate cup of inspiration. Um, you, you just sign up. It's called the flash briefing. And when you say Alexa, play flash briefing, which mine will probably play right now, <laughs> it'll, you'll hear me come on and give you your morning, morning inspiration. And you could also have exclusive access to the Get Real Deal and Heal Facebook page for support, questions, and community. So if I was live, this is just a slide I have in there because I would hand out cards basically to have people come and have a talk with me so we could discuss that. But since we're all virtual now, this is what I've put up. So if you go to www.yomenga.com and you go to the contact page, send me a message. You could put your name, email, phone, your message. And I have a meetup group as well, right? So I would love for you to join up the meetup, join my meetup group because I'll have different virtual things uh, there. I'm also on Facebook, Instagram. Uh, also, I have a YouTube channel. I've made, I think it's 16 videos right now, uh, voiceover videos. So if you find the Yomenga and subscribe to the Yomenga YouTube page, you'll be able to hear some of the videos that I created. And I would love to be able to uh, provide this to you and help you out. So I want to thank you for listening. Please go to my website. Uh, and I love this quote. I don't know who wrote it, but I think it's great. If you always do what you've always done, 
you'll always get what you've always gotten, right? Just something to think about. So again, I want to thank you. I appreciate you. Thank you for uh, joining this session. Uh, I appreciate it. So Bruce, thank you for hopping on. Irina, Renata, thank you so much. Again, if you have any questions, comments, please hit me up. I'd love to hear from you. And I hope you have a wonderful night. I'll open it up and see if you guys have any questions or comments. Let's see. No, I got to go, Dan, but it was nice and uh, good job. Appreciate it. Uh, Talk to you later. Please. Take care. All right. Bye. All right. So, Marianne, we're all good? <laughs> I suppose. <laughs> Thank you, Renata. Thank you, Irina. Oh, Irina, I unmuted you. Thank you for joining. And uh, stay safe and well until we meet again. Adios.